Something important to understand when it comes to this video are signs and symbols. And of course, those aren't the musical symbols. Those are symbols of like pictures and patterns. Because when we look at the subject in this video, certain patterns will unfold mainly among the context of images. The first image that we should notice is Thor's hammer, which is a war hammer represented with double sides and that induces lightning and thunder, which is a symbol that can be found represented in the gavel of the justice or judge, whichever name you want to call those particular criminals, in which the gavel is struck on a pedestal, which could also be considered as perhaps a law rock or a stone, thus creating the sound which is akin to thunder. And that comes when a justice or so-called judge makes a final decision upon something as they are the presiding representative and carrying the war hammer of thunder, shall we call it. Now, looking at a different area, the judges and justices usually send someone to a prison. And when we look at the prison of Azkaban in Harry Potter, we find some very interesting elements. The creatures known as the Dementors are these black clothed wraiths that are covered in black rags that go around tormenting prisoners and whatnot. So if we go to Wizarding World, we get a explanation of what a Dementor is. Quote, one of the most terrifying creatures in the Wizarding World, Dementors, were wraith-like creatures that fed on human happiness and generated terrible feelings of despair with any person in close proximity. And of course, close proximity is redundant. And they're using this here in a very jarring manner because the person writing this is attempting to impose language controls. In the worst case scenario, Dementor's kiss would allow the Dementor to consume a human soul, leaving them in a vegetative state. Although they were used as guards for the prison, Azkaban, Dementors were not known to permanently have it in any other location. The only way to protect against Dementors was with the Patronus charm. Notice Patronus starts with the word patron. And consuming chocolate would also alleviate some of the side effects of their close presence. Harry Potter was particularly affected by the Dementors due to the murder of his parents, to which his teacher, Professor Lupin, assured him he has nothing to do with weakness, and that the Dementors affect you worse than the others because... They, there are horrors in your past that the others don't have. The <clears throat> entity known as a ring wraith or Nazgul from the Fellowship of the Ring, Lord of the Rings series, bears similar resemblance to these Dementor creatures. From Wikipedia, Dark Riders and Black Riders redirect here. For other uses, see Dark Rider Disambiguation, Black Rider Disambiguation, and Nazgul Disambiguation. It should also be noted that a Schwartz Reiter or Black Rider, was a mercenary from the war of Wars of Religion in Europe. Anyway, the Nazgul from Black Speech, Nazg, Ring, and Ghoul, Wraith Spirit, introduced as Black Riders and also called Ring Wraith, Dark Riders, or the Nine Riders, or simply the Nine, are fictional characters in J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth. They were nine men who had succumbed to Sauron's power through wearing rings of power, which gave them immortality, but reduced them to invisible wraiths, servants bound to the power of the One Ring, and completely under Sauron's control. Lord of the Rings calls them Sauron's most terrible servants. Their leader, known as the Witch King of Angmar, or the Lord of the Nazgul, had once been the King of Angmar in the north of Eriador. At the end of the Third Age, their main stronghold was the city of Minas Morgul at the entrance to Sauron's realm, Mordor. They dress entirely in black. In their early forays, they ride on black horses. Later, they ride flying monsters, which Tolkien described as pterodactylic. The main weapon is terror, though, in their pursuit of the ring bearer Frodo Baggins. Their leader uses a Morgul knife, which would induce his victim to a wraith, and they carry ordinary swords. In this final bat, in his final battle, Lord of Nazgul attacks Eowyn with a mace. The Hobbit Mary Brandybuck stabs him with an ancient enchanted Numenorian blade, allowing Eowyn to kill him with her sword. Also according to Wikipedia, Black Speech is one of the fictional languages constructed by J.R.R. Tolkien for his Legendarium, where it was spoken by the evil realm of Mordor. In the fiction, Tolkien describes the language as created by Sauron as a constructed language to be the sole language of all the servants of Mordor. Little is known of Black Speech. 
Except the inscription on the One Ring, scholars note that Tolkien constructed this to be plausible linguistically and to sound rough and harsh. The scholar Alexandre Nemirovsky on linguistic evidence has proposed that Tolkien based it on the ancient Hurrian language, which, like black speech, was agglutinative. Of course, this is uh, highly. Uh, this article is intended to mystify and misdirect. On purpose, because black speech is clearly talking about them, academicians, uh, bureaucrats, lawyers, etc., which all seem to share a similar speech pattern and uh, writing pattern. I also notice that it is put under ISO 6393, which, of course, ISO standing for, uh, stands for International Standardization Organization. So basically, they're taking control over this product and obfuscating its true metaphor. Now, when it comes to the Grim Reaper, or La Santa Muerte, we find a similar range of symbolism. The Grim Reaper, of course, having the scythe and black robes. In the Wikipedia article, death personification in brackets, Death is a frequent is frequently imagined as a personified force in some mythologies. A character known as the Grim Reaper, usually depicted as a berobed skeleton wielding a scythe, causes a victim's death by coming to collect that person's soul. Other beliefs hold that the specter of death is only a psychocomp or a psychopomp, a benevolent figure who serves to gently ser sever the last ties between the soul and the body and to guide the deceased to an afterlife without having any control over when or how the victim dies. Death is most often personified in male form, although in certain cultures death is perceived as female, for instance, Marsana in Slavic mythology or Santa Muerte in Mexico. Death is also portrayed as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, most claim of its appearance occur in states of near death. And, of course, this is always with Wikipedia is coming from one perspective, that being, of course, the perspective of the controllers of which these depictions are talking about. Also, Santa Muerte is not necessarily a female. They are simply using the feminine form of saint uh, to say that it's female, but it's not. It's simply a ambiguous, well, a, uh, ambiguously for sex or gender that is uh, entity. This gives you a uh, another understanding of the hammer and sickle symbol, the sickle, of course, being the symbol for the Grim Reaper and the hammer being the symbol of the judge with judgment and, of course, Thor's hammer, bringing down the hammer on an anvil, creating thunder, etc. We, of course, notice uh, when it comes to certain elements, their physical, their attire, clothing, black robes and whatnot, and, of course, the fact that the judicial hammer is in fact a war hammer double-sided and another entity on the planet which is a very old uh, class of individuals they all wear equally black robes this takes us to the codes of the universal church so-called which most of us would know as rome or the vatican title one the acquisition of goods the church can acquire temporal goods by every just means of natural and positive law permitted to others. The church has innate right to acquire, require from the Christian faithful those things which are necessary for the purposes proper to it. The Christian, Christian faithful are free to give temporal goods for the benefit of the church. The diocesan bishop is bound to admonish the faithful of the obligation mentioned in and in an appropriate manner to urge its observance. The offerings mentioned in SS1 cannot be refused except for just cause and in matters of greater importance if it concerns a public juridic person with the permission of the ordinary, the permission of the same ordinary is required to accept offerings burdened by a modal obligation or condition without prejudice to the prescript of blah blah blah. Offerings given by the faith for a certain purpose can be applied only for that same purpose. The church recognizes prescription as a means of acquiring temporal goods and freeing oneself from them according to the norm of can blah blah blah. Prescription is the action or establishing a law, rule, a rule, law, or direction, something that is prescribed by rule, law, or direction, a written order, especially by a physician for the preparation and administration of medicine or other treatment. Remember that canon specifically cited the use of prescription to attain goods.
the administration of goods. By virtue of his primacy of governance, the Roman pontiff is the supreme administrator and steward of all ecclesiastical goods. Each diocese is to have a special institute, which is to collect goods or offerings for the purpose of providing according to the norm for the support of clerics who offer service for the benefit of the diocese, unless provision is made for them in another way. That section right there is very important to notice. Where social provision for the benefit of clergy has not yet been suitably arranged, the Conference of Bishops is to take care that there is an institute which provides sufficiently for the social security of clerics. Insofar as necessary, each diocese is to establish a common fund through which bishops are able to satisfy obligations toward other persons who serve the church and meet the various needs of the diocese and through which the richer diocese can also assist the poorer ones. According to different local circumstances, purposes mentioned in SS2 and 3 can be obtained more suitably through a federation of dioceses institutes, through a cooperative endeavor or even through an appropriate association established for various dioceses for the entire territory of the Conference of Bishops. If possible, these institutes are to be established in such a way that they also have recognition in civil law. An aggregate of goods, which come from different dioceses, is administered according to the norms appropriately agreed upon by the bishops concerned. It is for the ordinary to exercise careful vigilance over the administration of all the goods which belong to public juridic persons subject to him without prejudice to legitimate titles which attribute more significant rights to him. Those who by advice or consent must take part in alienating goods are not to offer advice or consent unless they have first been thoroughly informed both of the economic state of the juridic person whose goods are proposed for alienation and of previous alienations. Notice that word alienation as in illegal alien or a lien as in a lien on something. The alienation of goods whose value exceeds the defined minimum amount must also require the following. 1a, just cause such as urgent necessity, evident advantage, piety, charity, or some other grave pastoral reason. A written appraisal by experts of the asset to be alienated. Other precautions prescribed by legitimate authority are also to be observed to avoid harm to the church. An asset ordinarily must not be alienated for a price less than that indicated on the appraisal. Pious wills and general pious foundations. A person by, who by natural law and canon law is able to freely dispose of his or her goods can bestow goods for pious causes either through an act inter vivos or through an act mortis causa. Inter vivos simply means between living persons and inter vivos trust. This brings us to the state of Pennsylvania lunacy law of 1883. As amended by the Act of May 7, 1889, is further amended by a supplement passed the General Assembly of 1893. Now, it is important to note that most of the things inside of this document are actually post-dated after 1883, in fact, into the early 1900s. This was published uh, by Harris Harrisburg Publishing Company, State Printer, 1907. Made by the Committee on Lunacy, Isaac Johnson, Media Chairman, George W. Rion, or Ryan, Shemokin, Patrick C. Boyle, Oil City, Cyrus E. King, M.D., Allegheny, Edward K. Rowland, Philadelphia, J. Nicholas Mitchell, M.D., Philadelphia, Secretary. Now, down at the bottom section of this, <clears throat> an act to provide for the protection of insane persons, feeble-minded persons, and epileptics, and the appointment of a guardian for the said insane persons, feeble-minded persons, and epileptics, unable to care for their own property, authorizing the guardian to support the wife and children of the said insane persons, feeble-minded persons, and epileptics, to find the powers of the guardian, and authorizing sale of real estate of the ward. Notice the clear implications between this section and those sections that we just looked at in the canon law for the Vatican. Section 1, being enacted, etc., that whenever hereafter any person being a resident of the state shall become insane or feeble-minded or epileptic or so mentally defective that he or she is unable to take care of his or her property, and that the consequence thereof is liable to dissipate or lose the same and to become the victim of designing persons, it shall be lawful for either the mother, father, brother, sister, husband, wife, child, next of kin, creditor or in the absence of such person or persons or their inability, any other person to present to the court of common pleas of the county in which said person to be cared for resides, such as a priest. His or her petition under oath setting forth the facts praying, praying, right? Notice that word there, praying. The court to adjudge such persons to be unable to take care of his or her property to appoint a guardian for the state of such person. Yeah, that sounds like they're, uh, it's a scheme to acquire basically steal under fraudulent pretense of course because this law is very criminal the property of a lot of people a lot of people
Section 2, thereupon it shall be the duty of the court to fix a day for the hearing on such application and direct that 10 days written notice thereof be given to the person against whom the petition is presented. Right? Against, as in a, a antagonistic sort of sense, and also to the other members of his or her family residing within the jurisdiction. And if such person or persons cannot be found, then by notice such publication as the court may think proper. Upon the day fixed for the hearing, the court shall require the presence of the person against whom the petition is presented, unless there is positive testimony to the effect that such person cannot be brought into the court with safety to him or herself. At such hearing, the court shall take the testimony of all the parties and interest, and of such other witnesses as the petitioner and the person against whom proceedings are instituted, or any member of his or her family he or she may see fit to summon. On the question of the inability of the person against whom the proceedings are taken care for his property because of mental deficiency. If the court on such hearing shall be satisfied that the person against whom the proceedings are taken is not able, owing to insanity or weakness of mind, to take care of his or her property, then it shall be the duty of the court to decide and enter a decree accordingly and appoint a guardian to take care of the same. And, of course, we just read exactly what the stipulations for that guardian are. They're very open, and it's very convoluted as to the obvious implication of, say, a priest taking that role. If the person against whom the proceedings are taken shall demand in writing prior to the decision of the court on such application to trial by jury, it shall be thereupon be the duty of the said court to award an issue framed to determine the question of fact involved in such trial shall be granted. Now isn't that interesting, that particular section right there, section 4. That is called acting under the color of law, at least as far as U.S. Code is concerned, because they are pretending to carry out the Constitution while equally violating it in many parts. Section four, well, of course, that would be the original Constitution, not the super revised, obviously fraudulent one that we have today online, anyway. Section 5, from and after decree that the person against whom the same is entered be in, is insane or so weak in mind that he or she is able to take care of his or her property, the said person shall be wholly incapable of making any contract or gift, whatever, or any instrument in writing, and the entry of such decree shall be notice of such incapacity, and said person shall be ward of the court appointing such guardian. Oh, it also should be noticed that in Section 4 where it mentions a jury, that's from the area in the U.S. Constitution that all crimes shall be by jury, which therefore means that what they're in fact instituting here is a crime, according to them. And this, of course, has to do with all of the other phony crimes that they make up to steal people's property all over the state, all over the nation, and they're still doing it today, which is possibly the creepiest part of all this. Anyway, Section 6, the guardian so appointed shall have precisely the same powers and be subject to the same duties as a committee on lunacy in the state of Pennsylvania. The court appointing such guardian shall have the power over the same in directing and allowing allowance for said ward and for the support and maintenance of his wife or his children and the education of his or her minor children. There's your child trafficking component. And shall enter a decree of sale, mortgaging, leasing, or conveyance upon ground rent of the real estate or any part thereof of the said ward. This, of course, relates to those canon codes that we just looked at previously from the Vatican. Whenever in the opinion of the court it is necessary for the support and maintenance of the said ward or his family, yeah, of course, they're going to find the uh, I wonder what opinion they usually go with. <laughs> or the education of his or her minor children on the payment of his or her debts, or where it is for the interest and advantage of said ward that the same shall be sold, mortgage, leased, or let on ground rent. And all absolute sales and fee simple, except as hereinafter provided, shall be by the public sale or vend vendue, and may be either entirely for cash or partly on credit, and after full advertisement of, for at least 20 days by handbills posted on at least 20 of the most public places in the city or county where the said premises shall be situated, and in at least two newspapers, not less than three times on each, provided that if the court shall be of the opinion that under the circumstance a better price can be obtained by private sale than a public sale, the court may decree and approve the same like to the two churches. Of course, that would be a quote-unquote donation. Such sale, mortgaging, leasing, and letting on ground rent shall be upon terms of rates to be approved by the court when the said real estate is situated in the same county in which the said person shall reside, or in another county or counties, and the court shall be satisfied of the property of a sale, mortgaging, or leasing, or letting on ground rent upon such real estate or any part thereof, not within their jurisdiction, it shall be lawful for such court to make an order to decree authorizing such guardian to sell mortgage, lease, or let on ground rent all the real estate of the ward, or so much thereof as the court may think necessary, as it may designate. 
Thereupon it shall be the duty of the court of common pleas of the county wherein the real estate so designated is situated upon the petition of such guardian to make an order for the sake sale, mortgaging, leasing, or letting upon ground rent of said real estate, or so much thereof as the court appointing said guardian by its order shall designate, and such guardian shall in all cases make a return of his proceedings to the said court in the county in which the real estate was sold, mortgage, leased, or let upon ground rent shall be found only. This sounds a lot like the uh, idea of black speak, right? This is so evil, convoluted language that we find in a pattern across the spectrum when it comes to people and individuals that work in places like this. If the same be approved by the court, it shall be confirmed, and said guardian shall make a return of said proceedings to the court by which said guardian was appointed. The said guardian shall give such bonds and file such accounts as such periods as the court shall determine. Section 7. If at any time after the decree has been entered, the person against whom such proceedings are taken shall become able to care for his or her property, he or she, or any of his or her. Now... The term bailment refers to a legal relationship between two parties in common law where assets or property are transferred from a bailer to bailey. In this relationship, the bailer transfers physical possession of a piece of personal property for the bailey a certain period of time but retains ownership. And there you get that term posting bail and a bailiff. So, Pennsylvania State Hospitals. The Pennsylvania State Hospital System is a network of psychiatric hospitals operated by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. At its peak in the late 1940s, the system operated more than 20 hospitals and served over 43,000 patients. As of 2011, fewer than nine sites remain in use, and many of those serve few, far fewer patients than they once did. Many facilities or portions of facilities no longer in use for psychiatric treatment have been repurposed to other uses, while some have been demolished. Yeah, because they all served their purpose to steal a boatload of land, and once that's done, well, they they don't need to maintain, it, maintain them anymore. And, of course, now they have all these other ways to, I mean, they basically rule everything anyway. The first facility in the Pennsylvania State Hospital System, Harrisburg State Hospital, opened in 1845, and from its inception was tasked with providing care for mentally ill persons throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Yeah, for obvious uh, <coughs> advantages and certain privileges over their stuff. Many facilities within the system were state-operated from the start, while some initially operated as county poor farms, county hospitals, or other institutions. Of course, what exactly does that mean, state-operated? Right? As the number of institutionalized mentally ill dwindled, many state hospitals have been, in whole or in part, converted to other uses. Many have remained state-operated facilities, such as office building repurposes, correctional centers. Yeah. Big surprise there. These become, quote-unquote, correctional centers, dealing with the mentally disabled or feeble-minded, you know, criminals who are accused of the crime for a petition brought against them of their feeble-mindedness. Few former state hospitals have been demolished. Note on chart, Western Center was also a state facility for the mentally disabled and is located in Cannonsburg, Washington County, Pennsylvania. It consisted of multiple buildings and is closed. It closed in the late 1980s or early 1990s. Wow. That's the classic uh, level of writing you can expect from pretty much every outlet now, considering they all copy and paste these articles and then spread them across so that way when you look these things up, you only ever get this garbage constantly on your Google searches. But we have to work with this stuff anyway. After making a friendship treaty with the Lenape chief named Tamani in what is now Philadelphia's fish town and was called Shekamaxon at the time, Penn named the city Philadelphia, which means brotherly love in Greek. That's their alleged story of how Pennsylvania got its name. Allegedly, according to the same people who pretty much write everything that you find in the search results nowadays, the middle colonies included Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. Advantaged by their central location, the middle colonies served as port distribution centers in the English mercantile system. Notice, middle colonies, also possibly Middle Earth. Feature last updated April 14, 2023, a guide to Independence Hall at the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. Historic sites abound throughout Greater Philadelphia, but there are few more iconic than Independence Hall, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So, the UN controls it. It's their property. That's what that means. And the Liberty Bell. These two Philadelphia stalwarts, one of the most popular attractions in the city, are some of the and some of the most famous historic sites in the country make for 
must visits, whether it's your first, second, or 50th time in the city. Getting to see the bell in the hall does require some planning. Visitors must reserve tickets online or by phone in advance for tours of Independence Hall. Yeah, that's because it's a business. Run on behalf of the United Nations. Yeah, very independent. Ha, ha, ha. No tickets are currently required at Liberty Bell, but visitors may need to wait in a long line depending on the season. Independence Hall. During the blistering summer of 1776, 56 delegates gathered at the Pennsylvania State House and pledged their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor in the pursuit of independence. Yeah, I highly doubt it was called the Pennsylvania State House. That sounds like a newer addition. Now known as Independence Hall, the UNESCO World Heritage Site is where the Declaration of Independence was signed, final, finalizing the colony's break with England. Again, Wikipedia, Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell previously called the State House Bell or Old State House Bell. Yeah. Previously called by whom and at what time? It is an iconic symbol of American independence located in Philadelphia, originally placed in the steeple of Pennsylvania State House, now known as Independence Hall, and probably wasn't called Pennsylvania State House at the time either. The Liberty Bell today is located across the street from Independence Hall in the Liberty Bell Center in Independence National Historical Park. The bell was commissioned in 1752 by the Pennsylvania Provincial Assembly from the London-based firm Lester & Pack, later renamed the Whitechapel Bell Foundry, and was cast with the lettering, Proclaim Liberty Throughout All the Land Unto All the Inhabitants Thereof, a biblical reference from the Book of Leviticus 25.10. I'm sure there's some weird coded messaging going on there. The, obviously, invocation of religious context is important there. And that phrase has many meanings and considering it was made in 1752 I highly doubt that it was made in the designs of 1775. The bell first cracked when rung after its arrival in Philadelphia and was twice recast by local workmen John Pass and John Stowe whose last names appear on the bell. Boy those are some creepy CIA type names right? John Pass and John Stowe really? So dumb. In its early years, the bell was used to summon lawmakers to legislative session and to alert citizens and citizens about public meetings and proclamations. Isn't that nice? Now, as it concerns that name, we should notice the word penance. An act of self-mortification or devotion performed voluntarily to show sorrow for a sin or other wrongdoing, a sacrament in some Christian churches that includes contrition, confession to a priest, acceptance of punishment, and absolution. Repentance. Notice the obvious uh, correlation to the word penitentiary, a prison for those convicted of major crimes, the tribunal of the Roman Curia, having jurisdiction in matters relating to penance, dispensations, and papal absolutions. A priest whose special function is the administration of the sacrament of penance in a particular church or diocese. Notice the similarity between the confession booth and a prison cell or solitary confinement. Now, in a book called Six Months by Ameri in America, Six Months in America, by Godfrey T. Veen, published or, or recorded in the Library of Congress, we get an uh, idea of Pennsylvania before the Lunacy Acts, in which we sort of see the lead up, at least in pattern, uh, or the planning for a forethought for this operation that was carried out and is clearly the motive or at least one of the many motives behind the u.s civil war so-called anyway six months in america by godfrey t veen esquire of lincoln's inn barrister at law library of congress city of washington 1867 philadelphia published by thomas t ash 140 chestnut street 1833 preface to the first american edition i'm not going to read that it's uh, very tedious all right, in this paragraph, on this page, we get a rather interesting note that perhaps some people weren't really aware of and kind of speaks to what freedom actually looked like under a const true constitutional republic, where at the original start, these operations that are so blatant nowadays had to be carried out in a more secretive manner so that people did not become wise to the game being played. On the Long Island beach, see New Utrecht, a small sea bathing place, and celebrated as a spot where the British troops and the command of Sir Henry Clinton were landed without opposition, previously to their attack on New York in 1776. 
Numerous vessels of different sizes that had been detained outside by contrary winds were working on their way through the narrows at the same time and presented a most animate and na- animating spectacle. They were from all parts of the world, and the sun shone full upon their white sails. The broad, bright pine streak reddened beneath his declining rays and added a characteristic elegance to the appearance of the American ships, which, taken as a class, are certainly handsomer than most of any other nation. That the trim and figure of British merchantmen are usually inferior to those of America is owing to the circumstance of there being no tonnage duty in America, and therefore their ships are constructed for the carriage of a given number of tons with the greatest speed, but by British method of raiding their ships, a merchantman can be constructed so as to carry more than her legal tonnage without paying for it, of which John Bull very properly takes advantage by swelling out his ships as much as possible, as, so long as he can avoid the lay liability of being charged at a higher rate. Now we get a description of his travel to Philadelphia. It was the 23rd of April, St. George's Day, when I left New York to commence my tour. The members of St. George's Society were going to dine together, and the huge banner of the saint was waving from one of the upper windows of the City Hotel. As I emerged from the gloomy recesses, an enormous establishment's eclepted, eclipsed single-bedded rooms and proceeded to the wharf where the new Brunswick steamers are to be found, and where it is coolly and most intangibly animated, intimate, intimated to the traveler. In very large letters that he can, he can have transportation to Philadelphia at a very trifling expense. These steamboats are necessarily very large, being frequently destined to carry three or even four hundred passengers. They are constructed in the best manner for obtaining the greatest proportionate space and a free circulation of air. They may fairly be said to be three-deckers. The working beam is usually placed at a great height above the upper deck, and the whole of the engine is so much raised that no inconvenience arises from the heat of the boilers. When one of these steamers is seen approaching from a distance, the confusion of green and white galleries gives it much the appearance of a moving summer house. Now, the last paragraph on this page is particularly important. Borden Town is about 26 miles from Philadelphia. Next day, I proceeded to the city in a steamboat, which stopped for passengers at every considerable village on the well-wooded but flat and uninteresting banks of the river. At length, Philadelphia makes its appearance stretching for nearly three miles along the western side of a bend of the angle of the river, or angle of the river. This view is certainly a fine one, but it would be much improved by the appearance of a few more steeples or lofty structures. Sounds like he's uh, doing some planning for future endeavors or projects or joint ventures, etc. From the water, two or three only are visible above this immense assemblage of red houses, and yet the city contains nine Episcopal churches, a great number of public buildings, and charitable, charitable institutions without end. That is how they took over the United States and undid the Constitution. Charitable institutions, of which the so-called universal church has controlled for... Well, time out of mind. Great attention is paid to the education of the poorer classes. The Constitution of Pennsylvania declaring that the legislature shall as soon as convenient provide by law for the establishment of schools in such manner that the poor may be educated without expense. That's their plans on uh, the brainwashing institutions we have today. Philadelphia has been often described. The streets cross each other at right angles. Those running parallel with the river are numbered second, third, fourth, etc. The others usually bear the name of some fruit or tree. The word street is usually omitted in describing the way a person would tell you that the place you were looking for was in Walnut, below 5th, Sassafras above 2nd, Mulberry between 7th and 8th, etc. That's still a similar pattern today, but that's very long gone, that form of uh, city planning. These streets run over a distance of two miles from the Delaware to the Schuylkill River, which enters the Delaware about seven miles to the south of Philadelphia. The Bank of Pennsylvania is a small building, but elegantly designed from the Temple of the Muses on the Ulysses near Athens. The new mint of the United States was unfinished, but promised to be a chaste and beautiful building on a larger scale from the same model. On the 4th of July, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed and afterwards read from the steps of the State House, where the State Courts of Justice are now held. The room in which this took took place had been fitted up for Lafayette in 1824 as the most appropriate 
place for levy tenure. But when he saw it, it was occupied by workmen who had instructions to replace everything as it was when it acquired its present reputation. The Academy of Fine Arts much exceeded my expectations, although the most conspicuous pictures were those of the American academicians. Yet here and there, the eye was attracted by a Van Dyck, a Rubens, a Garcino, and a Salvatore Rosa, or some other good copies from them. And the rest of this is not exactly, not exactly important to this video. Now, in a different section of this book, in my way back to the city, I visited the penitentiary of Pennsylvania. Notice, of course, that word, penitentiary. This is the most extensive building in the United States. The front is 670 feet in length, very handsome, and bearing a baronial and gloomy appearance in the style of our old English castles. It, er, its area is a square with a tower at each angle of the prison wall. It is intended that eight corridors should radiate from the an observatory in the center of the area, but only three are in use at present. These contain the cells and command a free circulation of air and a plenty, plentiful supply of water. The only punishment adopted is solitary confinement. This penitentiary is too young in establishment to afford a perfect confidence in the opinions of those who are favor favorable to its system. The reports of the inspectors are, however, extremely encouraging. The first and present ward, or warder, not ward, warder, Mr. Samuel R. Wood, was only appointed in June 1829. This gentleman, who is well known as a kind of second, Howard in his way, has visited many of the principal prisons in 15 Europe, and now finds employment for his talents and his family and his humanity in, I believe, his native city. Every crime committed in the state of Pennsylvania on this side of the Allegheny Mountains that is punishable by imprisonment at all for the space of one year or more is to be expiated by solitary confinement within this penitentiary. That at Pittsburgh on the Ohio receives those whose crimes are committed on the western side of the Allegheny. Every prisoner is allowed to work at his trade or if he have one or one that he cannot follow in his cell, he is allowed to choose one and is instructed by one of the overseers, who are all masters of different trades. Mr. Wood, in his last report, gives it at his opinion that a prisoner who has two years or upwards to remain in prison can, in his solitary cell, earn sufficient to clear all his expenses from the admission till his discharge. Yeah, that sounds um, suspicious. It's, well, suspiciously like what we have today. It's essentially slave labor by another name. The Philadelphia system differs from that at Sing Sing in the state of New York. At Sing Sing, the prisoners are brought out to work together, but are not allowed to speak to each other. At Philadelphia, they never work together, and from time, the time of his admission, one prisoner never sees or speaks with another. My English ideas were not a little startled at first when I found that high treason is expiated by solitary confinement for not less than three, nor more than six years, and that the punishment for the second offense was solitary confinement for ten years. Treason against the state of Pennsylvania is here alluded to. Notice, of course, that treason against the state of Pennsylvania, which is a very odd perspective, considering treason is against the United States, according to the Constitution. Anyway, by the Articles of the Constitution. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or in confession in open court. Congress shall have the power to declare the punishment for treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. Treason against the United States is a capital offense. Murder in the second degree, that is, murder committed in a sudden quarrel, but without malice, prepense, is punishable by solitary confinement at labor for three, not more than six years for the second offense for a period of not exceeding ten years. Somehow that doesn't sound like the Constitutional Republic concept in the Constitution, but okay. The punishment for burglary is solitary confinement for not less than two, nor more than ten years. For the second offense for a period not exceeding fifteen years for robbery or being accessory sixteen thereto before this act, the period is not less than one, no more than seven years, and for the second offense for a period not exceeding twelve years. Mayhem, kidnapping, horse stealing, perjury, etc. are all punished by solitary confinement for different periods. Almost every species of forgery or aiding, abetting, or commanding the perpetration of a forgery, whether it be 
of the coin of the state or have reference to the sale, utterance of delivery, or have in possession the metallic plate used in the forging of any note of any bank incorporated in the state of Pennsylvania, or forging, defacing, corrupting, or embezzling any charters, gifts, grants, bonds, bills, wills, convictions conveyances or contracts or defacing or falsifying any enrollment registry or record or any forgery any entry of the acknowledgement certificate or endorsement whereby the freehold or inheritance of any person or persons may be charged or of counterfeiting the hand or seal of another with intent to defraud or the privy or great seal of the state of pennsylvania it is punishable with solitary confinement for a period of not less than one, nor more than seven years, and for the second offense for a period not exceeding ten years, it is expected that few offenders will run the risk of solitary confinement for a second time. Of course, that doesn't really sound like the U.S. Constitution. In addition, we should also note <coughs> that here the word person is not specified to what kind of person, and considering nowadays the juridic person is given the moniker of human, well, that just throws everything into a real convoluted mess, doesn't it? Anyway, when first received, the prison prisoner is left alone, and it seldom happens that he does not ask for a Bible and work for the lapse of a few hours. Bible and a few other religious books are allowed him in a few days, the withdrawal of his employment is felt and adopted as a punishment with the most obstinate and hardened. The chaplain occasionally visits the prisoners, and on Sundays he takes a station whence the words of prayer and exhortation can be heard by every prisoner in his cell as they echo along the vaulted roof of the corridor. Yeah, that sounds like the um, torture methods that uh, are well known, where somebody blasts really loud music at all hours to keep people up. And naturally, that is a game that is invented by the church. No surprise there. If any punishment can be said to be dignified, that of solitary confinement has a claim to the epithet. Yeah, of course, the free labor and slavery doesn't, uh, you know, have a advantage there. And, of course, the ability to steal people's property, right? They love that one. Justice to society is nobly done, not only in the room of, of the prisoner in the first instance, but secondly, by enabling him to return, as it were, to the world a wiser and better man. The end of solitary confinement is the reformation of the criminal by obliging him to think who never thought before. If reflection can be awakened and conscience can be obtained a hearing, its advantages will be readily acknowledged. Yeah, advantages to a bunch of corrupt little pieces of crap that want to steal everybody's stuff. The prisoner is forced to commune with his own soul. The all-powerful voice of ridicule is absent and unheard. Remorse is not stifled. And penitence is not put to flight. Pennsylvania Penitentiary. Penance. By the sneers of a dissolute companion. With no one to admire and applaud his resolution to be game, to submit is the only alternative. In England, the system cannot generally, I think, succeed. The effect of solitary confinement might be the same on the moral character of the prisoner, but unless something like a permanent means of getting a livelihood be secured to him, after his removal from the prison, the principal and best object of the punishment would not be obtained. This will be extremely difficult in a country of small extent, with a super abundant population and a supply of labor far exceeding the demand. The regenerated offender might perhaps contrive to avoid observation, but if necessity compelled him to labor for his substance, substance it is probable that he would not find employment and that the no necessary consequence would be that all his good resolutions would vanish at the approach of want. No country is well adapted for the experiment as the United States of America. And boy, I hate when they repeat that crap all the time about the great experiment has failed. Enterprise is abroad in every direction, and labor is well paid. And of course, notice that this writer is one of those pieces of garbage that comes from the, uh, you know, inns of court, the little uh, petty lords, or as is more accurate, the ring wraiths engaging in their black speak. When the period of Confinement is at an end. The criminal may wander to any corner of that vast continent and go where he will. The wages of industry are always at his command. He is in little fear of being recognized by his fellow prisoners because no prisoner is allowed to see another. His former associates in crime are dispersed or in prison or in the grave. And the hope that attained, attended him in his cell is realized by the facility of gaining a new character and friends who are ignorant of his crime. 
Yeah, that doesn't sound creepy. Should be added to this notice of the penitentiary that every cell opens into a small paved courtyard in which the prisoner can take exercise, and that the system has not been found prejudicial to the health of mind or body as had been anticipated. And of course, this system became their little mental institutions that eventually became their correctional institutions. I visited the museum at Philadelphia, which is said to be the best in the United States. It contains a skeleton of the mammoth, a fine collection of Indian curiosities, and American animals. And, of course, that's the end of our description there of that particular institution, of which, at this point, there were only two. So let's go and look at some of efforts to induce that state of... Uh, feeble-mindedness that was a crime according to these little priest charitable organization judges that we call today who are really nothing more than dementors, ring rates, or any of those other creepy representations of who they truly are. This is Toxicologie des Fleurs, La Toxicologie du Fleur, or the Toxicology of Fluorine Symposium at Bern 15 to 18, or 15 to 17. There's, yeah, 17 there. October 1962. Dr. T. Gordonoff, professor on der Universität Bern, so Bern University. The important component of the symposium comes from an A. Singh, Endemic Fluorosis, Department of Medicine, Government Medical College, Patalia, or Patila, Patiala, I'm not sure how to say that, India. A. Hydrofluorosis. Chronic fluorine intoxication, as manifested by maltodol enamel and diffuse osteosclerosis of the skeleton, has been observed in different regions all over the world. In India, this condition was described in 1937 from the Madras state by Short and his colleagues. Our interest in this problem was aroused by the fact that we observed a number of cases of paraplegia presenting a well-defined and almost uniform clinical picture from almost the same geographical area. And now, all of this stuff is very useful, but let's go ahead and move on to the part that's important to this video. Neurological changes. The neurological complications of fluorosis resemble very much the features of cervical spondylosis and other pathogenic mechanism is also similar. Broadly speaking, they are of the nature of a radiculomyelopathy. That's hard to say. We observed 41 cases in a series of 409 cases. The radicular features result in muscular wasting acropathesia and subjective pain referred along the nerve roots while the myoclypathic features usually result in a complete spastic paraplegia. Objective sensory changes are observed in about 60% of the cases while visceral disturbances are almost universal. The details are described in the original paper and of course neurological refers to uh, the neuro brain stuff, right? Latent fluorosis. While skeletal fluorosis is at once obvious, the skeletal fluorosis clinically does not become obvious until it advances to the stage of crippling fluorosis. However, radiological involvement, the skeleton is manifest at a much earlier stage and is the only means of diagnosing latent fluorosis. Such cases are otherwise healthy in young adults who have not, as who have as yet not received exposure to fluoride over a sufficiently long period. Their only complaints are vague pains in the joint and back, and usually labeled as suffering from rheumatoid or osteoarthritis or having vague neurologic neuralgic or myalgic pains. These in reality are symptoms of latent fluorosis which on radio radiology may show osteosclerosis or be present even prior to development of definite radiological changes. So this poisoning of which we find these materials in literally everything, fluorescent lights, uh, fluoride and water and toothpaste etc. all over the place. Well and, of course, pesticides. It leads to cognitive decline, what would be registered as mental feebleness and would provide the ability to steal people's property in large mass and uh, large amounts, and, you know, the masses, the property of the masses, so to speak, to give them to the quote-unquote universal church. So this is the chemical induction component, which eventually leads to a really awful and prolonged uh, diminishing into death, where a person's body literally breaks down. It's a long-term plan of poisoning. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please join my Discord. Check out my other uh, work. Uh, share and subscribe, and 
There are free books available at the link, and if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Catch App. Thank you.